it's going to be a fair election. If it's a fair You're election, what? I am 100 percent on board. But if I see tens of thousands of ballots being manipulated, I can't go along with that. The American people will decide who the next president of the United States will be, period. Asked how he would respond to any interference in the election, Trump said, quote, we're going to watch all of them. We have to be very careful. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for The Washington Post. Today, it's my great pleasure to welcome James Clapper, the former director of national intelligence from 2010 to 2017 for a conversation about election security and other issues. Uh, director Clapper, uh, welcome. I want to begin with a question that's uh, right in front of us as we turn on the TV uh, today, and that's uh, President Trump's uh, uh, health uh, and reports about his health uh, as he returns to the White House after his diagnosis for COVID-19. I want to ask you, uh, when we're all focused on these daily bulletins from doctors, what opportunities does that give foreign intelligence services at a moment of great vulnerability for us to in some way uh, interfere or manipulate uh, the process of information of, about the president and his health? Well, first, David, thanks for having me. It's a, a great honor to be on with you. Um, I, uh, yeah, this is a great, a uh, period of great concern. Uh, no question about it. Uh, we, we are so totally consumed with um, the president's health and the, the extensive media reporting on it. Um, and we're just consumed with it. And, it, and, and not to mention uh, the infection of, of other people surrounding the president. Now, uh, the, uh, I just learned the chairman of the JCS and the service chiefs are quarantining. So all, the, all these kind of things are just a huge distraction uh, for us, where our national security apparatus is consumed with matters domestic and, and internal. So this is an ideal time for um, adversaries, particularly in adversary intelligence services, uh, to look for ways to further uh, confuse us, to distract us. And of course, uh, you can bet particularly our good friends, the Russians, are, are doing this uh, by further sowing uh, seeds of disinformation. And they will appeal to all the various tribes uh, and, and continue to capitalize on the polarization and divisiveness of, of this country. And certainly his state of health it will is a high priority intelligence target, collection target, uh, particularly for adversaries. So it's, it's, it is a vulnerable time and it's an opportunity for them while we're not looking uh, and not being alert to further sow uh, seeds of disinformation, casting doubt, discord, distrust in the country. So let's turn to the question that lies just a, a month ahead, and that's our November 3rd election. Uh, and we have been all discussing, worrying about the security of that election, uh, wondering about how uh, Russia or other adversaries might seek to interfere with the process. Let me ask you uh, to just summarize what Americans should be concerned about as we head to the polls or, or use uh, mail-in voting, uh, how do we keep this election, keep our democracy uh, safe uh, when there's such an obvious desire to interfere and manipulate? Well, I think David, first, just to set the stage here a little bit, I think there's a uh, kind of a high level point I, I, I would like to make which is when we speak of or think about or worry about election security, for me, it kind of falls into two broad bins. And I think 
you know, I've talked about this before, but I'll just, um, again, for as a stage setter, uh, make this point. First, of course, are the uh, cybersecurity dimensions, uh, securing uh, voter registration rolls, securing uh, any time there's a, a, a computer involved, whether it's uh, accommodating votes, taking votes, um, collecting them, computing them, compiling them, and reporting them. And particularly if there is any kind of, if there is any connection with the internet, that that poses a vulnerability. But I think a lot has been done uh, to uh, secure the voting apparatus as, a, as an enterprise, acknowledging the fact that it's very decentralized. You know, 50 states and the territories, um, some 3,000 counties and I don't know, countless precincts. So it's very decentralized. It's not run by the federal government. That is both a strength and a weakness because it makes it very difficult for an adversary to on a broad scale, interfere. I also think there's been huge, uh, uh, probably, I don't know for sure, but it's, it's from what I, I read, lots of improvement since uh, 2016 when uh, we were enduring a, a broad gauge attack by the Russians then. The other then though, and, and the issue, and the reason I make this distinction, because these are the things we can work on and have been worked on. DHS, FBI, and state and local officials, I think, have done a lot, even though I think you'd find, if you did a survey, that probably it's uneven. The other bin, which is, much, to me, much more problematic, and this is the uh, what I'll call cognitive security or intellectual security. In other words, how do we arm ourselves against the, the uh, misinformation? the information operations warfare that we're enduring. That is much more difficult because it, it requires individuals to question what they see, read, and hear. So I just want to make that, uh, make that point. Because of the decentralization, uh, I think the voting process, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty confident in it. Um, they haven't seen, uh, to the best of my knowledge, um, the reconnoitering, I'll call it, that went on in 2016, in the run-up to the 2016 election, that is, where the, the Russians clearly were um, exploring, reconnoitering um, uh, voter registration rolls or, or the, some state apparatus, a piece of the state voting apparatus. And although we didn't see it in all states, I think the assessment was that they tried this in all 50 states. And we haven't seen a lot of that, and we haven't seen so far uh, hacking, um, which of course is uh, forensically uh, easier to trace. That's why they're better served to, uh, and which I think they're doing, is just do the misinformation business, the information warfare, uh, fake postings on, on, uh, on social media and the like to mislead to suppress voting, to discourage people from voting. I, so I do worry about that. But the basic process, particularly since there uh, is a lot of um, workarounds uh, because of the pandemic. So uh, mail-in ballots, voting in advance, uh, which my wife and I have done, we've already voted. And I think lots of people are doing that. So I think all of that would be hard to uh, alter uh, dramatically. But I worry more about the, the cognitive security and uh, what influences people to make voter decisions, which I think was a, a huge factor in, in 2016. Uh, President Trump has already warned about his uh, concerns that there will be fraud in, in mail-in voting uh, because of the extensive uh, mail-in voting, it's likely the count uh, will be delayed. We probably won't have a result, certainly early on, on election night. In that uh, situation, what are the dangers that Russia or other adversaries would try to manipulate the uncertainty about the outcome? And maybe more to the point, uh, Director, how can American citizens protect themselves against being manipulated uh, in, the, in this period of uncertainty? Well, the, the Russians, uh, no doubt in my mind, um, will uh, continue to sow doubt discord 
and, and distrust uh, of our system. And if there is a delay, which I expect there will be, in compiling, commuting all the votes from all the states, and, that, and I think most people understand, but I'll just say it, that there is no legal requirement that the results of the election have to be decided and announced uh, that night. I mean, that's kind of the mode we've gotten into, um, but it, there is no legal requirement. But, so one of the things that I think we all need to be is patient about this and have some faith and confidence in uh, the legitimacy of, of uh, state and local uh, election counting and uh, vote counting processes. So we need to be patient. What can people do? That is a great question and something I haven't, uh, uh, I don't know I have a, a silver bullet solution for. Now, the Rand Corporation has uh, written some, put out some books on what they cleverly and aptly call truth decay, which is the general uh, uh, skepticism about facts, data, and objective analysis. And it manifests itself in all kinds of ways uh, here and it's not just and it's not just endemic to this country. It, other other countries have the same problem. And and it's been going on here for you know ten or twenty years. And it's not uh, initiated by President Trump, but he certainly uh, amplifies it. In fact, the irony is he plays to the same narrative as the Russians do, because they're trying to cast doubt on our uh, on on um, mail-in voting, for example. And so, ironically enough, the Russian narrative and the president's narrative are the same. So, as I've, in my journeys around and visits to colleges and universities uh, before the pandemic, I always en enjoin the students not to believe everything they see, read, and hear on the internet. And they have to develop, or should develop, their own ways and means of validating and corroborating uh, what what they what they hear what they read and and all of us as citizens uh, need to do that but unfortunately uh, given uh, the social media ecosystem and uh, the proclivity in this country which I don't fully understand of, of just buying into relishing reveling in conspiracies uh, QAnon uh, comes to mind as, as, a, as a case in point. And this is, a, frankly, a dangerous trend, and foreign adversaries, most notably the Russians, uh, take advantage of that. And they will certainly during the election. And if there's uncertainty in the immediate period after the election, which I anticipate there will be, uh, the Russians will be in their uh, pitching um, and making the outcome um, uh, in doubt and if it appears there's a, a winner, let's say Vice President Biden wins the election, well, they will do the same thing they did in 2016 because they anticipated then that Hillary Clinton would win and then already laid the groundwork for discrediting a Clinton administration. And they'll do the same thing again here if Vice President Biden wins. So, Director, following on your comment about the parallel narratives from uh, President Trump and the Russians, I, I want to ask you a question I thought I'd never ask a former director of national intelligence, and, and that is, do you think the Russians have leverage uh, on this president? And beyond that, do you think we'll ever have a definitive answer to that question of, of whether they have something on him or not? Well, I'll answer the second question first. I think someday, somehow, yes, uh, the, uh, the truth will come up. And of course, this is something that has been widely speculated about uh, ever since uh, you know, 2016. And I, I don't know. Um, I do wonder, of course, about, as, as everyone does, about the uh, foreign um, fi financial support that the president appears to get. Uh, and, you know, which is pretty big. I mean, if the, if the president were a, a normal employee, he'd be under uh, scrutiny, a uh, serious scrutiny, because one of the um, vulnerabilities that you're concerned about when you're, when you're deciding whether to grant access to classified information is uh, financial uh, state of health. 
And so, obviously, the, I think the, the New York Times revelations about uh, the president's income taxes, and which are not definitive about uh, where he's gotten foreign funding, uh, would lead to speculation that uh, if the Russians have something on them, it has to do with finances. But again, this, this is purely speculation. I don't know. But I do think that at some point in time, uh, in the future, that uh, the truth on this will, will, will emerge. So let me ask you about your uh, former uh, uh, organization, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Your successor, John Ratcliffe, is not, uh, as you were, a career intelligence officer. He's a strong political supporter of, of, of President Trump. Uh, there's a concern that that office uh, of the DNI has become more political. I want to ask you what the effect of that is on the rank and file employees of the intelligence community. What does this mean in terms of their performance, their sense of professionalism, uh, their concern that somebody's looking over their shoulder? Well, uh, it has to have a, a chilling effect, uh, David, uh, on um, uh, the rank and file. Now, I, ha I hasten to point out, though, that there are large parts of the intelligence community that are not affected by the political fall of all. Uh, one of my, one of the agencies that I was head of for a while was uh, what's now called National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. It's a largely technical and it's not all that effective. I do think and, uh, you know, people overseas uh, doing their intelligence jobs are just kind of putting their nose to the grindstone and doing what their particular mission is. So there are large parts of the community that aren't directly affected. There are parts, though, that are, and most notably for the Office of Director of National Intelligence. And uh, I think CIA is affected by it, and certainly the FBI. And so I, I do worry about that. I mean, there's a, a hallowed uh, tenet of intelligence, some somewhat of a simplistic uh, bumper sticker maybe, but it does capture uh, the spirit uh, of what's important in the intelligence community, which is telling truth to power. And if you have a portfolio that is uh, of interest to the, to the president, like on Russia or North Korea or, uh, or some other thing, and, and you, you're an analyst and you produce intelligence to the best of your ability that is uh, counter to the worldview of the president, uh, that puts you in a puts you in a bad place. It really does, and it it it's got to have uh, subtle maybe inhibitions on what flows, uh, what intelligence flows on on particular topics, and this is not good. Now, having said all that, I have to I hasten to point out as well that policymakers, to include policymaker number one always have the option of ignoring, rejecting uh, uh, intelligence that they're presented. I would offer that over the long haul on many issues, doing that is, is dangerous for the safety and security uh, of the country. And if you have a president that is in a reality bubble that's different from reality, rea real reality, that's, uh, that's not good. Let me ask you about one specific example that worried me about possibly uh, pulling punches uh, by the, the IC. And that was the decision not to give a public worldwide threat assessment. I remember that was never your favorite session, but you did it and it was important. What's your feeling about that no longer being public, being done in private, but presumably for fear of avoiding offending the president? Uh, that's, that's right. I. I... Uh, never liked those uh, sessions. Uh, you know, it's it's awkward when you're basically trying to talk about classified subject in, a, in an unclassified setting. Uh, but, and I I found it amusing and ironic that uh, Director Ratcliffe dredges up a letter I I wrote. Uh, I don't know, 2012 or 2013, way back when, uh, trying to avoid these uh, public hearings. But I, have, I tell you, I grew to appreciate why they are important. I think it is uh, important that the American public see firsthand uh, the leaders of, of the key agencies of the intelligence community. 
and that they hear directly from them uh, about threats confronting uh, the country. And yeah, I didn't like them, but uh, I, I do think that is uh, a uh, important uh, function that the DNI and the other leaders of the intelligence community uh, need to perform. And they're not doing it right now. Uh, and obviously, after uh, the experience of Dan Coates, uh, when he, uh, in fact, I think it was the last time we had such a hearing and said something, and he spoke truth to power and did so publicly to his great credit and got hammered for it uh, by uh, the president. Uh, you know, you need to go back to school and all that because uh, Dan said some things were the, which were the best, represented the best judgment in the intelligence community. And as and he and others got criticized for it. And that that is that is not good. Uh, American people should hear the unvarnished truth from the leaders of the intelligence community. So I'm going to let that be uh, our final word, the unvarnished truth from the in intelligence community. That is what the public wants and needs. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. I want to thank you, uh, Director Clapper, for spending this time with us and with, with me. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Dave, for having me. It's great to be on with you. So, uh, folks, we have uh, much more of our program on election security and disinformation coming up. In just a few minutes, my colleague Joseph Marks will be back with disinformation experts Graham Brookie and Ashley Bryant. So please stay with us. When words are not protected, what stories go untold? What goes unreported? What goes unknown? Words are the lifeblood of our freedom. Words are truth. They bring us together. They help us ask questions and understand each other. We need to be strong for words. And to be strong, we must come together. We are louder together. Hey everybody, my name is Wajahat Ali, New York Times contributing op-ed writer, recovering attorney, and exhausted dad. I'm joined today with Suzanne Nossel, and we're going to talk about how disinformation might impact free speech in the days ahead. Suzanne is the CEO of PEN America, a free speech and literary organization, and also the author of this wonderful book, Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All. I actually read the book. She did not ask me to promote the book. It is very helpful for today's conversation. Suzanne, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Waj. And you can Venmo me uh, 10 bucks if you want for promoting Love the book. Uh, I know that you in particular in PEN America have been doing a lot of work in tracking the impact uh, of disinformation on this country. Specifically, uh, just to start us off, why is disinformation a free speech issue to you? Yeah, sure. Look, this goes back for us at Penn America to the Penn Charter from 1948, which commits us as an organization to fight against what they called then mendacious publication. So publication mm -hmm. intended for partisan or pecuniary gain. And we have seen that weaponized in 2021 with floods of disinformation about our politics, about the coronavirus coming from foreign countries coming from within uh, partisan sources here in this country. And for us as a free expression organization, this undercuts our very purpose. I mean, why do we protect free speech in the, in the first place? It's not just so each of us can say whatever's in our minds. The notion is that through an open marketplace of ideas, we can better discern fact from falsehood. The best ideas can rise to the foreground. We can persuade one another and bring about a better society and progress through that deliberation. Now, when the marketplace is flooded with disinformation, with messages that are coming from unknown sources, with shadowy motives, people trying to make a buck or to take over our democracy and interfere with it, that process is undercut. We don't know what we're reading. We can't make sense of it. We don't know what to credit and what not to credit. We have to be skeptical about everything we see and hear. And so for us, this is a clear threat to healthy civic discourse, and we're committed to fighting against it. So we all need some good news. So give me some good news, and please tell us what exactly PEN America has been doing to fight 
and combat disinformation? Well, we've launched a campaign and we've called it what to expect when you're electing. And our notion here is that really the best offense against disinformation is a good defense and that we need to inoculate Americans against the scourge of disinformation. How do we do this? By educating people about what they're seeing, getting them to ask questions, to take a beat when they see something outlandish in their social media feed, to question it, to go and verify it, do a, a few minutes of research before they spread it and potentially contribute to disinformation or a conspiracy theory. And we're spreading the word through an online campaign, through a fantastic video with John Lithgow and Alan Cumming and Anita Hill, Britt Bennett and others. We've got a quiz that's available on our website that you can do to make sure you're an informed information consumer we're doing trainings all over the country for citizens, but also people like librarians who have a chance to spread the information across to all those with whom they encounter. And we're also engaging directly with people in the news media, editors and publishers to ensure that as they prepare for this election that will be in so many ways like none other, that they are really thinking carefully about how to deal with unverified claims, how to deal with it when a politician spreads disinformation? Should that be reported on as part of the news? How do they make clear to their readers and their audience whether information is, is believable or needs to be called into question? And so we're on a full court press to help awaken the citizenry of the United States going into this vital election that they need to be on alert. All right, you mentioned the election and just last week in the presidential debates, uh, President Trump, again, question the uh, alleged integrity of this upcoming election, sowing some doubts. How are the rest of us supposed to fight back when some of this dis disinformation is coming directly from the White House? Look, normally we rely on our leaders to be authoritative sources of information. If there are competing claims in the public arena, a leader ought to be able to stand up and say, you know, here's what we know to be true. In the context of the pandemic, that should be our public health leaders who have the definitive information coming from credible health agencies, the World Health Organization, the CDC. That unfortunately has been eroded right now in our politics. And there is a flood of disinformation about the election, about the reliability of mail-in ballots, about whether and when polling stations are going to be open, about what you can expect in terms of lines what you should be worried about, what you need to do in order to ensure that your vote will be counted. And so it's extremely important that as voters, we set about to get the accurate information. And to do that, you can go to our website at pen.org. We'll direct you to sources that are credible, secretaries of state of the 50 states who can give you the definitive information about how and when to vote, organizations that are in the business of helping people who are in jeopardy of seeing their votes potentially suppressed. So there are places to turn for reliable information, but it's incumbent upon each of us to go and seek it out. And don't just assume that what you're getting in your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed can necessarily be relied upon. Because you know, all too often we know that may be coming from a source that is anything but what it purports to be. We've seen instances where people claim to be part of a protest movement here in the United States. And you know, it later comes out they were actually in Moscow. And so we really all need to be on guard. All right. So if you want to join the cause, if you want to fight back, if you want to support Pen America, join them. Go to pen.org and find out more about what you can do to fight disinformation. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for joining me in this conversation. She is the CEO of Pen America, a free speech and literary organization, and the author of this wonderful book, Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All. Back to my friends over at Washington Post Live. I hope it's going to be a fair election.
Welcome back to Washington Post Live. Thank you everyone so much for sticking around with us. Uh, my name is Joe Marks. I am a Washington Post reporter and I write the Cybersecurity 202 newsletter. And I'm joined on this panel by two great guests to talk about disinformation. We have Graham Brookie. He is director and managing editor of the Atlantic Council's Dis Digital Forensics Lab. And we have Ashley Bryant, who is co-founder of Win Black I'm going to say this wrong. Win, win Black Palante. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize. A, um, a, a group focused on combating disinformation that targets black and brown communities. Uh, welcome, both of you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So, so Graham, I, I want to start with you. You heard uh, former Director Clapper say in the previous panel that the president's message on uh, uh, unfounded information about mail voting and Russia's message are relatively similar. In this election, are we in more danger from disinformation that is from domestic sources or foreign sources? Yeah, that's a great question. And I mean, the first point is that disinformation is a challenge that doesn't recognize our neatly defined borders around the world. Uh, and in this election in particular, it, there's no question that the scale and scope of domestic disinformation is far greater than a foreign adversary could ever do to us. Uh, but one really important point is that it, that doesn't take away from the very scary, serious national security threat that is foreign interference operations from adversaries like Russia. Uh, and it, the other point about that is that it, the domestic demand and, and very robust supply of disinformation makes us more vulnerable to foreign adversaries. And Ashley, the Senate's report on uh, Russian interference in the 2016 election found that there was no group that was more targeted by disinformation than African Americans. Can you tell us about that and, and what your organization is, is doing to try to combat it? Sure. You know, I mean, this is just a, a continuation of voter suppression tactics. It's no different than the poll taxes, the literacy tests. I mean, this is the weaponization of digital media in order to continue suppressing the black and brown vote. What we're seeing, you know, coming out of 2016 and well be, be beyond and before um, is really the impetus for Win Black Palante. We started this rapid content operation and monitoring system about about eight or nine months ago in order to really step into the gap where we felt like folks weren't investing in the resources needed to really combat the misinformation and disinformation that we're seeing targeted to Black and Latinx voters. And so what we've done is create a model where we're keeping a pulse on this disinformation. We're looking at the trends. We're working with our research partners. But quite honestly, the secret sauce is our network. We've built a network of over two or 300 uh, organizers on the ground across 15 states. Um, and we're working with these groups in order to give them the content that we know that's going to be resonant and it's going to move black and brown voters and serve as a counter to the misinformation and disinfo that we're seeing in the space. And what kind of campaigns are you seeing that are targeting black and Latinx voters? What, what are the phony narratives and, and what are your counter narratives? Sure. I mean, we're seeing everything from, you know, we have this democratic plantation uh, narrative that, that we saw bubbling up over the last couple of weeks. You know, obviously, we are also seeing uh, operatives that are posing as Black activists that are using cultural language that is uh, relevant to the Black and Latinx communities and building these communities and groups on Facebook, um, on Twitter, on Instagram, but ultimately trying to depress the vote. Um, they're trying to depress black and brown voters and make folks feel as though we're not wanted in, 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 this, um, in this democracy. And so, you know, beyond just the democratic plantation, we're also seeing the Black Lives Matter movement being thrown against uh, black and Latinx, but also the divisiveness. Uh, what we see is these bad actors knowing that when Black and, and Latinx voters show up together at the polls, we show up stronger and things change. Um, and so what they're trying to 
do is draw, draw this line of demarcation. They're using um, the Black Lives Matter movement and uprising and flipping this narrative as, as if Latinx communities aren't welcome to march in the streets with us. They're using these narratives as if uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is somehow against family separation. We're seeing a lot of conservative and, and right wing um, uh, voices in the space really just completely distorting the actual purpose of, of the movement, but using that to, to divide uh, our two communities from really participating in this democracy together. Graham, a lot of what Ashley's talking about seems as much aimed or even more aimed at sowing division between people as it is any particular political end. Does, does that jive with what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the point of disinformation is to drive us further away rather than closer together. And the thing that democracy depends on is a shared set of facts in order to make collective decisions together. That's what we're going to do uh, this election season. That's what voters are already doing when they're voting by mail or voting early. Uh, and, and disinformation is designed to, A, seep through the cracks of any policy that we create against it, which is uh, a point that uh, Suzanne made in the last session. Uh, but it's also designed to just make us more angry, make us uh, a little bit more partisan, uh, and it detach us a little bit more, again, from, from facts that it, an informed electorate absolutely needs to show up and, and make decisions for ourselves. Hey, Graham, what does Russian disinformation look like now, and, and is that different from what happened in 2016? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the things that we see from Russia are, A, first and foremost, it's a matter of record that they mounted enormous influence operations and interference operations in both 2016 as well as 2018 midterms. Uh, and what we see right now is, yes, a shift in tactics because there is increased scrutiny. Uh, Russian interference is now a kitchen table topic uh, in the United States when you talk to, uh, you know, people in Ohio or people where I am in Colorado, they're like, oh yeah, no, there's Russian trolls on Twitter. Uh, I know something about that. And so with increased scrutiny, uh, tactics change. And what we've seen from 2016 to now is in 2016, there was a hack and leak operation, which Director Clapper uh, mentioned in his session. And, and that was the most successful component of, of what Russia tried to do. There was also a lot of online activity targeting specific demographics, much to Ashley's point. Uh, and, and driving up as much online engagement, what we saw in 2018 was trying to drive that online engagement into action in the real world. And now in the lead up to the elections here in 2020, we see all of those tactics. We see, uh, you know, throwing, throwing everything at it to see what works and what doesn't. The good news is a number of those things have not worked. Uh, we know from Microsoft disclosures, I think three weeks ago, that uh, they absolutely tried a hack and leak operation. Uh, but you're not reading about leaks in the newspapers right now, which I think is generally a good thing. And so as scrutiny increases, the tactics shift and get more sophisticated, but I think we're a little bit more prepared. Uh, but again, that doesn't take away from the seriousness of this national security issue. And some of it's also jumping off of social media, right? And, and getting into sort of phony articles by mainstream media. Absolutely. I mean, there's a huge amount of amplification. I think that, uh, as you know from your own reporting, it's highly unlikely that you're going to find, you know, a strict command and control and coordination in, in closed channels, right? There's not uh, the editor in chief of the Russian internet agency, research agency, uh, coordinating with, with alt right trolls in a WhatsApp chain saying, you know, here's what we're going to launch on Tuesday. Uh, but the amplification of those narratives is the same and it has the same impact on a larger audience. And so that's where we're talking about more resilience and individual users kind of knowing what to do uh, when they say when they see disinformation on the Internet. Uh, Ashley, I want to jump to an audience question for you. I apologize for reading it. This is from Erica Goodman from Pennsylvania. Do you have a sense of how many black voters could be affected by disinformation campaigns in this election? And if so, where do you get those statistics from? Sure. You know, this is something, and thank you, Erica, for your question. You know, this is something that we're tracking very closely, but I'd point to, you know, just last week there was an expose around the 2016 Trump campaign that was very clear that 
they targeted 3.5 million Black Americans with disinformation in order to dissuade and deter, literally labeling Black Americans as deterrents, um, in order to prevent folks to go to the polls. So that alone just gives you a number, and that and that's four years ago. Um, we know that each year that, that this has uh, gone on, it's evolved the same way that the, the internet evolves, right? And so as we're preparing, you know, we're looking at the vote gaps in our battleground states. We're looking at the number of registered voters or unregistered uh, Black or Latinx voters. And so we're really doing some very uh, complex targeting as we think about how are we meeting folks with the messages that is going to counter this misinformation and disinformation educate voters. Um, but as, as Graham talked about, you know, we actually have to educate voters on how to spot this, um, what they should be looking for. But it's also just as important to use these proof points. This is not what we're imagining. It's not what we're assuming is going to happen. We actually have the proof. We have the data showing that the Trump campaign intentionally tried to get Black Americans to not show up to the polls. Voting is not a partisan issue. It should never be. Voter suppression is not a partisan issue. This is actually a threat to our democracy. We should want to have a country that wants to hear and wants to amplify the voices of every voter in every corner of this country. The fact that it has become a partisan issue really shows the line in the sand of where we've gotten to as a country. And it's no different than where we've been. And that's the problem. There is no change here. It's just getting worse. And we have to be vigilant with projects like when Black Palante in order to create models that we're keeping a daily pulse on what's happening here. We're educating Black and Brown voters. We're encouraging Black and Brown voters to show up and be present. And we're doing the, the work and building the infrastructures that are needed to actually combat these voter suppression tactics and add an accountability, not just to the platforms, but also to the actors, and some of which being this administration are contributing to dissuading, confusing, and distorting the information that is needed to have folks be participants and in this process. And just to put some specifics on that, um, I know one of the campaigns you worked on was connected with the, the boycott of Goya Foods after the CEO endorsed the president. Could you tell me what happened there and what you discovered and what you did? Sure. Um, and so, you know, a couple months back, the CEO, as you said, of, of Goya Foods made an appearance, uh, I believe, in the Rose Garden in support of uh, Trump and his uh, policies, if you call them that. And so, um, Coming out of that, there were um, leaders like AOC, um, Julian Castro, who came out to say, if you support this administration, then you obviously are not standing with the communities that are your consumers, that are your uh, base um, in order to keep Goya and a, a successful business and brand. And in minutes, if not hours, there was a flood of uh, negative um negative comments or uh, content that was in support of the Goya CEO, really um, inciting some uh, extreme conversations under AOC's post, under Julian's post. Um, and we found in less than a couple hours that these were actually bots. These were automated posts. These weren't actual supporters of Trump or the administration. These weren't real voters or, or constituents. These were actually bots that were um, that were deployed into the social space to give the perception that there is a larger support for Goya backing Trump and his policies versus the opposite. And so this is another, uh, another observation of where our group was able to identify this and start to work with our partners to flag this to Facebook, to flag this to some of the other social platforms. And it's, it's not that hard. Regular folks can't make 7,000 posts in one hour, right? Um, and so when you think about these uh, platforms, you know, there are some complex algorithms that make social media the fun, you know, place that it is. But these, the same science and engineering that goes into building this sense of community can also go into protecting our democracy, protecting um, the the voices of real folks and, and really protecting us against this disinformation tactic. Uh, Graham, Ashley was talking about flagging these things to Facebook. How are the social media companies doing at this now? 
Well, it depends on what you're talking about when you say this. Uh, I, a number of the teams at social media companies have gotten very, very good at looking at things like coordinated and authentic behavior, uh, or what they would call coordinated and authentic behavior, especially from foreign sources. Uh, so there have been a number of disclosures from Facebook, uh, from Twitter, from Microsoft, from Google, uh, all saying, you know, here's what we see foreign actors doing on our systems. Here's what that looks like. Here's some context. Here's some evidence. Uh, that said, a another category is, of course, public health misinformation. I, I think we can all kind of wake up in the morning and say we should downgrade or do content moderation on things like coronavirus misinformation. Uh, in fact, this morning we had a very prominent example. Uh, Facebook outright removed a post from the president uh, while he was downplaying the threat of coronavirus against Americans. Uh, uh, and so it, everybody is kind of, yes, we should uh, both upgrade objective information or fact-based information, accountable information, while we should downgrade or remove uh, misinformation about coronavirus. But the third category, is, the platforms are inherently reactive to, and it's because they are they become a target of this in and of themselves, and that's political disinformation. And while we're reactive to political disinformation, specifically that spread by the President of the United States, who has a re-election strategy that is based on, in part, disinformation, especially disinformation about the process of the election, when, where, how to vote, as well as the results of the election, uh, then you're going to be really, really reactive. And that puts us in a very dangerous spot for having trusted information about the results of this election or how this election season that is happening in the, in the middle of a pandemic is playing out. It's interesting you mentioned that the president's post on Facebook. It um, it took several hours, I believe, for both Facebook and Twitter. Twitter, I don't know if it removed it. I think it labeled it instead. Um, and during that time, you get you know tens of thousands of likes and retweets. You know, given the pace of social media, can we ever truly combat this in real time, Ashley? You know, I don't know if I if I have the magical answer there, but I do think, you know, to Graham's point, there are steps that we can take to initially try to get a hold of this. You know, what I'm noticing is there's quite a bias, and I, I'm glad Graham, you know, talked about the public health crisis and and disinformation within that because you know this should be something that's handled across the board. We shouldn't have to. Uh, we shouldn't. We shouldn't be okay with. Facebook or Twitter being vigilant around COVID, but not vigilant around death threats. We shouldn't be okay with, oh, when when the president is diagnosed with COVID and people are making disparaging, disparaging comments around him potentially dying, well, platforms were quick to address that within a day. But when the squad, our, our four new uh, uh, congresswomen have been facing abuse in, on Facebook and Twitter for years now around um, death threats um, and all types of things, it's, it's, it's very unbalanced as to when these platforms decide they want to step up and add some accountability here. And so I think it's, it's, it's different. You know, we can talk about, are we ever going to get a handle on this? But there's so many different components to where this is why I hold them accountable. I think that it is it goes well beyond just building an algorithm and now we can tell everyone is lying. But I think there has to be at least an acknowledgement of handling information equally, no matter who it is is targeted, no matter what category it is, if it is deemed false, if it is deemed disinformation, especially from elected officials who have a responsibility to this country and to, to our, our residents of this country, then it should be handled equally across the board. And to me, that's the first step of accountability. And we can work through the science and the engineering behind it. But that, to me, is the initial step. Graham, uh, the intelligence community has talked about disinformation campaigns this election cycle from Russia, China, and Iran. Can you explain the difference between these three? Are they, are they all the same? Should we be paying more attention to what Russia is doing than the others? Or is this all in one big pile? Uh, it's all in the same category of foreign interference or foreign influence. But I, I think that calling them all equal in the scale and scope of activity is the evidence just doesn't bear that out. And so what we've seen is uh, first and foremost as a as a way to frame this on August 7th the ODNI 
uh, or the Office of the Director of National Intelligence released an assessment that said, as you mentioned, uh, Russia's at it and China's at it, Iran is at it. Uh, and since they've mentioned a few other actors, uh, foreign actors. And what they didn't mention, or what they, I guess what they did mention was, here's what all of those actors think. Here's what our assessment is about what all these actors think. But what they did not mention was, here's the scale and scope of activity that we see from each one of these actors. And, and that is more valuable information in building transparency and building resilience against that threat of foreign interference uh, than just kind of what the views of any given country are about the US elections. Uh, and so what we've seen in, in evidence, especially through what we're calling our foreign interference attribution tracker, which is an independent rating system to basically say, uh, okay, if somebody says the Russian bots are at it again, or if somebody says China is spreading disinformation, it's a way to say that source is credible, that source is transparent, here's the evidence that goes along with that. And what we've seen is that the scale and scope of activity in this election from Russia is far greater than any other foreign adversary. Uh, and that's bettered out in evidence from sources ranging from disclosures from tech companies, from disclosures from government uh, or government officials, uh, and disclosures from, uh, frankly, media, wh where they're seeing uh, any number of source material and the material that they're covering. And so the scale and scope of activity from Russia at this point is far more aggressive. And I would categorize it as this kind of approach of, which has been consistent since 2016 of uh, engaging, infiltrating, and, and then trying to drive people a little bit further apart rather than closer together, right? That chaos theory again. Whereas what we have typically seen from China is a little less aggressive approach. It doesn't mean it's any less serious, but it's more kind of present and persuade uh, in what they would call discourse power. They very much want people to, to agree with them, uh, especially the diaspora community, the Chinese American diaspora community, and especially uh, not necessarily Americans, but people closer to their uh, geographical remit, so Southeast Asia and other places. And then we see kind of the same thing from Iran where it's this present and persuade, uh, find people that are predisposed to maybe think that it, the United States has not always been a force for a uniform force for good in the world, and then give them a little bit more of the Iranian viewpoint to push them a little bit further down that road. Uh, and so that's a lot different than creating things like Facebook groups uh, and then trying to get Americans to go into the street to create po protests. Uh, and again, you're gonna see a variance of approach, uh, especially from a wide degree of authoritarian countries, uh, but that doesn't mean that they're equal threats. And that's something that we need more transparency. It's something that we need more evidence, especially from government, which has the unique ability to tell Americans about that. Can, can you break down that distinction, especially between Russia and China, as it relates to the upcoming election? They've also said that Russia prefers that Trump be reelected. China prefers that Biden be elected. Um, is there difference in the scale of how they're trying to achieve that? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. There's a difference in, in what they're doing to achieve those ends. But I would also push back a little bit on the assessment of kind of viewpoints from both of those foreign actors. And so one very, very, very small network that had very limited impact uh, that was disclosed by Facebook, but the, attributed to actors in China, was actually uh, both pro and anti Donald Trump and pro and anti Joe Biden. And so the kind of it, very simplistic binary of either they're for or against any given candidate doesn't it, it fully explain, A, their strategic kind of approach to influence operations, and frankly, it doesn't drive at what they're actually trying to do, which is make America a little bit less of a formidable adversary or competitor on the international stage. That said, and to your question, again, the aggressiveness, uh, the egregiousness of Russia's activity targeting the United States and targeting the United States uh, electoral process and democracy, the democratic discourse more broadly, is far more, again, aggressive than than what we've seen from China. And that doesn't mean that we're gonna have massive disagreements or massive competition. It doesn't mean that China is going to not spread disinformation. They absolutely are. We've seen a notable uptick in disinformation from China in the context of coronavirus, but it, their approach to election interference is just different. And without having that kind of understanding of the threat space, we're going to have we're going to be explicitly backfooted in trying to protect that information space.
So we're running out of time. We have just about a minute left. I want to close by asking you, Ashley, we are in such a weird time with a pandemic across the nation, the president infected, uh, the, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff now quarantining. When the world seems a little bit like a conspiracy theory, does that make it harder for you to combat disinformation and spread correct information? Absolutely. I mean, you know, everyone's skeptical of everything right now, rightfully so, right? And I think uh, it's definitely harder when it's coming from the top. It's coming from where most folks are used to turning to in moments of, of crisis. We're used to turning on the television and wanting to watch a speech from a president that is going to comfort us, give us the facts, um, and an administration that is going to um, continue to educate and not limit access um, to things. And we're seeing this across the board, right? And so it has caused this deep cynicism in voters um, and just in people uh, just overall. What I what I like to think is, you know, hopefully we're going to come out of this with folks having better instincts. You know, I like to even draw it to a couple years ago or maybe more than a couple years ago, we were all answering every single phone number that crossed our screen because we couldn't fathom that it wasn't someone who didn't know us. Right now, I can spot a spam or a telemarketer call from a mile away. And we even have technology now that even says, you, you know, your phone screen says spam risk or it says telemarketer. And my hope is that coming out of the cynicism, we're not just going to allow people to withdraw. Um, and that's honestly, you know, really the value that we want to bring with Win Black Palante is to take this cynicism and turn it into education. We want folks to be able to spot disinformation. We want you to instinctively be able to look at a post, understand if it's a real person or not, really exercise restraint in learning who are credible sources, starting to kind of compile who your credible sources are and how they're being backed by other organizations that you know are uh, credible and are actually doing work in the communities that matter most to you. And so hopefully this will start to kind of ingrain some of this in, in instinction to really start to say, you know what, I know this is fake. It's too, it's too extreme. It's only here to incite me in, diff in different ways. And I'm going to ignore this and I'm going to find the facts and I'm going to continue to educate myself. And if we can get folks to have those instincts and to exercise that restraint, then, you know, maybe we're coming out of this with something more valuable than what we came in with. And on that semi-optimistic note, uh, thank you <laughs> so much, Graham and Ashley, for joining us. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thanks so much. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everyone, for also joining us. I just want to let you know before we go, we have a great lineup of interviews at Washington Post Live this week. Tomorrow at 11 a.m., Columbia U University President Lee Bollinger is going to join us to discuss the future of free speech in the U.S. Thursday morning, you can tune in for First Look, your one-stop shop for news and analysis about the upcoming vice presidential debate. And once again, I'm Joseph Marks of the Cybersecurity 202. Thanks so much.